Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to a very important conversation. It's a reimagine child care town hall looking at the child care crisis, not just in New Jersey, but across the nation. We're about to meet a very distinguished panel who are really experts, people who understand the child care crisis from a variety of perspectives. But before we go to that panel discussion, I had an in-depth, very important interview with Dr. Lynette Fraga, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Child Care Aware of America. Dr. Fraga talks about the child care crisis, not just in New Jersey, but across this nation, and explains why it matters to all of us. Let's check out that conversation. Good to see you, doctor. Hello, nice to be here. Great to see you as well. This is part of our larger Reimagine Child Care initiative, all about uh, public awareness around affordable, accessible, quality child care. Tell everyone what your organization is as we put the website up. Sure. Child Care Aware of America is a national nonprofit membership organization that focuses all of its efforts on ensuring that parents have access to quality, affordable, accessible child care. And we do that through policy change, research, data, practice, wanting to ensure that our early care and education providers and our families are all supported in the best interest of making sure children and communities thrive. Hmm. Doctor, how severely has COVID, as we tape on the 20th of July, I'll be seen later. How severely has COVID impacted the child care industry and more importantly, the children in it and the parents of those children? So firstly, the, thank you again for focusing on this topic. And um, the pandemic has severely challenged the child care system. Let's be clear, prior to the pandemic, the um, child care system was certainly at definitely fractured, if not at the breaking point. And through the pandemic, um, because of the challenges um, that we all seen um, globally, uh, it's really created a crisis. Um, and we are really at the breaking point at this point. Early care and education providers um, unable to, um, to work, um, programs unable to stay open, the challenges of families having access to care, the expense of ensuring health and safety, all multiplies and exponentially contributes to a real challenge and concerning trends we're seeing even today as we are um, continue to stay in the midst truly in the pandemic. What's the broader impact of that for our, our nation? Fewfold. Um, firstly, we have been saying since the beginning of the pandemic, no child care, no recovery. Uh, if families don't have access to child care, they can't go back to work. Um, if um, children don't have quality programs, uh, then they also are suffering in their ability to be able to thrive um, and, and with their readiness for school. So it truly is a significant impact on, um, on our communities, on our employers, on our parents, on families, earning potential. Um, for example, one in five parents have shared that, um, that disruptions in childcare, disruptions in, in in-person schooling have either decreased their hours significantly or have um, created the inability for them to actually be able to return to work. Uh, that is severe, not only for the individual parents, but for the families and their ability to be able to support their own, um, their own households. It's, it's really a challenge. But doctor, the impact has not been felt evenly across the board. It's been felt disproportionately. And some people may be tired of hearing about it, but we're not tired of talking about it because it's, it's horrific and it's embarrassing. Talk about it. It is disproportionate. There, again, have been existing disparities, um, not only for um, the ability for families to access care. We're talking about care that is expensive, that um, that many families are unable to access it. For many families, um, for example, for single parents, it could be upwards of 50% of your income in order to pay for care. Then layer on that, um, that um, early childhood educators themselves only make, for example, $12, $12 ish an hour as a median income nationally. That is hardly a living wage. Then you speak into the fact that there is um, that disproportionately women of color, 40% um, of, of the early care and education workforce are women of color. And most of the workforce, of course, are women. 
um, in early care and education. So we are looking at this issue in terms of disparities and inequities, not only as a workforce, but also in terms of access to care. And there are childcare deserts all over the United States where families don't have access to quality care. And that's really it, excuse, me, excuse me for interrupting, Dr. Is course. it forcing a disproportionate number of women to literally leave the workforce? Yes. So what we've seen in 2020 is, 20, is 2 million women have, less, have left the workforce. Um, and what we're also seeing is that for women who are leaving the workforce, uh, we may not get back to pre-pandemic levels until 2024, which is much longer than men returning to work. So we're really seeing a disproportionate impact on many levels for women, women of color, for families who have the inability to be able to access care, for the um, unaffordability of care. So there really is a significant challenge multifold across the child care system. So I want to ask you about the Biden administration and their policies around child care, the tax credits, uh, uh, early childhood education, et cetera. But, but real quick, compare New Jersey to the rest of the nation as it relates to the child care um, environment and, and, and situation. So in New Jersey, um, you all are also uh, experiencing challenges in terms of affordability. It does um, it is significantly um, expensive, um, again, upwards of almost 50% for a single parent, 13% of a household income um, for um, a married couple with children. Um, not to mention our really housing costs. Not to mention housing costs. Well, for many across the United States, and New Jersey is no exception, childcare often exceeds the cost of, of rent or mortgage um, for your home. So it really is a significant part of um, household income. And in New Jersey as well, just like in the rest of the United States, there's a real struggle in identifying staff um, for programs to work at um, early care and education programs. So many early care and education providers were not able to keep their jobs through the pandemic. Um, and many of them are not returning um, to our early care and education workforce. And staff shortages are also becoming a real problem. So um, programs, absent staff, uh, staff are what makes the magic happen in child care. Uh, and so absent staff are really running into a huge problem in terms of access to, to quality programs, notwithstanding the challenges we already have with the expense associated with child care. Before I let you go, the Biden administration, child, uh, is it child tax credit? Mm -hmm, the child tax credit. What mm -hmm. is it? And again, what is the impact? There, so, so firstly, the child tax credit, um, at, you know, the idea that, um, you know, 50% of children can be pulled out of poverty as a result of um, the child tax credit and dollars going to families with children to really help with the expense is incredibly beneficial um, to families and um, as we're looking at additional proposals that are on the table, um, like the American Jobs Plan, which helps to contribute to um, the facilities and the structures of child care um, of child care programs, like lead mitigation, for example, is incredibly important, and that lives within the American Jobs Plan. And it's really important to, again, as I said before, the magic happens with early care and education providers, so we have to pay attention to staff. And that's where the American Families Plan comes in, really paying attention to the early childhood workforce and investing in that workforce for years to come. And there are other congressional bills also out there that can also speak into um, the investment needed for a sustainable changed system of child care. We can't go back pre-pandemic, in fact, because it was already fractured. We want to build a better system as we move forward in service to our children and families so they can thrive. Well said, Dr. Fraga. Listen, we thank you for joining us and being part of our public awareness initiative, public education effort around child care, um, not just in New Jersey, but across the nation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This streaming, if you will, town hall looks at the child care crisis, not just in New Jersey, but across the country. You may ask, what do you mean a child care crisis? A crisis in employees, there's a shortage of staff, affordability, there are people who are not able to work because they can't get child care for their children. It is not enough of a priority. I'm not here to editorialize, but it's not enough of a priority for our public officials with all the other priorities they have. And so we're going to be looking at the child care crisis from a variety of perspectives. And to do that, and by the way, 
COVID has made what has already been a crisis even worse. So in that spirit, let me introduce, enough from me, but our distinguished panel. First, our, our longtime friend joining us, Cecilia Zalkine, President and CEO, Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Seal, good to see you. Thank you for having me. All the way from Harvard, Dr. June Lely is a senior lecturer in early childhood education, the chair of the Human Development and Education Program at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and also State Assemblywoman Yvonne Lopez, representing the 19th Legislative District, very involved, very committed to child care and child care advocacy. Assemblywoman, thank you so much for joining us. And finally, back again with us is Winifred Smith Jenkins, senior director of Zadie's Nurturing Den, which is a highly respected child care organization, not just in New Jersey, but across the country. Um, and by the way, throughout this program, we'll be putting our Reimagine Child Care website up. People can go up and find more information. Seal, let me start with you and let's jump right into this. What exactly is the child care crisis, A and B? Why should everyone watching right now, now care deeply? Well, the child care crisis actually is not new. I think the issues confronting child care existed long before the pandemic, but the pandemic has made them worse and also much, much more visible. Issues around how parents can find affordable, high quality care, how programs can uh, support themselves in a time of great stress when they're businesses that don't have uh, a lot of financial wherewithal uh, to support themselves, and the, the pandemic has certainly exemplified that. And I think the most critical issue is the child care staff. Uh, this is a staff that has been undervalued and underpaid for years, and I think as things reopen in our state and there's a greater demand for child care programs, which you'll hear today, are struggling to hire staff back for staff to return or hire new staff. And it's important, not just to the families who need it, but to our state. This is essential to our economy. Doctor, I want you to jump in here. You're listening to Seal talk about uh, child care professionals, the workers, the frontline folks, not being appreciated enough. A, why do you think that is, doctor? And B, what do we specifically and precisely need to do about that? And one of the reasons we have the Assemblywoman on is because she's going to talk about her legislation dealing directly with that. Dr. Lee, please. Well, I think the work of caring professionals in general um, tend to be undervalued. Historically, um, women tend to fill that particular role. And in the child care sector, we have uh, women of color that fills that role uh, in a significant way. Um, I think the one thing that we have to start is to recognize that child care providers are professionals, regardless of whether they have had access to the kind of credentialing opportunities that they have. We just have to recognize that the work they do is professional and their professional work is part of the infrastructure of a basic society, whether we're thinking about education and employment. So seeing them, recognizing them as professionals would open the doors for us to think about compensating them fairly, provide them the kind of opportunity for the kind of credentials and education and development they need and to integrate them into the larger world of education and social service and health professionals, as opposed to think of them isolated as just child care providers or babysitters and so on. And by the way, as I, I go to uh, um, our other colleagues in this program, and I'm going to ask Winifred about the frontline situation and, and, and what's happening with her workers, but I just want to remind folks, whether you have children of a certain age, you know, zero to three, zero to four, or not, this is an issue that affects all of us. I mean, just think about how many men and women have a very difficult time going to an office, not going to an office, but working from home. And they don't have quality, affordable, accessible childcare. This isn't simply a childcare issue. This is an issue that affects all of us, particularly those who care about our economy and functioning and business and being able to pay our bills and, and live our lives. And, and in that spirit, uh, Winifred, let me ask you, uh, you heard Cecilia and Dr. Lee talk about frontline workers. What are you seeing? By the way, tell everyone what Zadie's Nurturing Den is, A and B. What's happening with your professionals? So Zadie's Nurturing Den um, is a family-owned and operated child care center that educates children from zero to six years old. Um, 
pre-pandemic, we employed over 90 people, 96%, which were women of color or immigrants, and 4%, which were white. Uh, we cared for and educated over 350 children. Currently, those numbers look totally different, um, and that's part of the problem, right? Um, it's a problem of staffing shortages. We have at least eight empty classrooms at uh, one of our facilities, four empty classrooms at another facility. Um, the undervaluing and underappreciation, because again, 90% across you know the industry and workforce, 90% of which are women, um, society doesn't seem to place a lot of value on the care and education of young children. Do you think people understand, like say, okay, argument's sake, they're underappreciated, they're undervalued, but do you think most people understand the impact of those professionals in the childcare world being unappreciated, undervalued? Because it's a devastating impact, Winifred. I don't. I think that um, if you just go back to like just the basic job description, right? right. Um, the women in the classroom and men too, if they're there, but early care and educators, they're to develop an effective learning environment that builds a foundation for language, cognitive skills, and social emotional functioning in a developmentally appropriate manner. So we're literally setting the foundation for a child's entire life. Children make the most gains between zero and five than they'll humans than they'll ever make across the board, right? Um, so I don't think that people understand the true impact of what the profession brings to society. By the way, I'm going to go to Dr. Lee in a little bit to talk about the long-term educational implications of a child not having a quality, accessible, affordable child care. But assembly, let me ask you, your personal connection, A, to child care, and B, we'll talk about your legislation. Why do you care so much? You know, as a former CEO of a preschool here in Perth, the Envoy, the, I saw childcare and how devastating it was before the pandemic. And now after the pandemic, we're in a deeper crisis, right? I remember days when um, the parents would drop off the kids and they would be rushing because they would have to get to work and they, wouldn't, they, they would not swipe their cards. So we found that to be a pattern. And what we did was we assigned um, I, I, one of my staffers to come to the front lobby to help the parents with swiping the cards. And these are all, these, this is all subsidy driven um, childcare, by the way. Um, my preschool, we had 75 students, right? Ages three to five. We had probably about 10 teachers and it was difficult. You know, we had to, um, the Board of Education um, provided the funding, 1.1 million, but we had to put in an additional $250,000 to sustain the school. So for me, um, childcare has always been uh, really close to my heart. Um, I would tell you that um, last year in when the pandemic started, the legislature was 100% focused on COVID-related relief, everything from uh, rental assistance to food insecurity to utilities to, yeah, uh, you know, a telemedicine. Where child, I'm sorry for interrupting, Assemblyman. Uh, mm -hmm. Assemblyman, where did child care fit into this discussion in the state legislature? It's always been, uh, for me, it's always been- uh, Not just for you. Yeah. For your for the disproportionately male colleagues, where do you think it fit? I, well, I tell you that once the advocates came together, they started to scream and yell and protest, right, and advocate. We all came together as a caucus and as a body. You, you know, right. most, of, most of us in the caucus have children, right, or we have grandbabies. So we all understood the need for child care. And right. especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when we saw the first responders um, and, and having the child care centers uh, losing the children, we understood that we have to support the first responders, right? That's, that's what we started off with. And we did a really nice job. I think we did a really wonderful job. We invested tons of money into childcare. One of the things we did in preparation for this reimagined childcare town hall meeting is we went on Facebook and Twitter and a whole range of social media platforms. Cecilia, you and your organization um, put out the fact that we were doing this town hall and we asked for questions. Some of them are on video, a whole range of them are social media questions that we have and we summarize them with, if you will. But I'm gonna to go to a video question 
I believe, team, this is from Megan, correct? This is from Megan, um, who, she can speak for herself, but she speaks for a lot of other people in asking this question. Let's go to Megan. Are any of the other issues worth the investment if we do not fix the compensation and staffing crisis that is affecting early education today? Wow. Okay. So, so Seal, let me go to you. Megan's question is very clear. If we don't deal with the compensation issue, what is the value of the other investments in childcare if you do not have the professionals to be on the front lines? Because what if it's closing classrooms because she doesn't have enough staff, largely around compensation? Go ahead, Seal. So I think as we've learned more and more about the, the crisis and the impact on childcare, it's very apparent that the key to providing a childcare system for families and for our state is the staff. We have to engage staff. We have to prepare staff effectively. I think Winifred's description of what that staff person does, they're critical to the life of a very young child. Um, and we have to compensate them. I think that's, to me, that's the key. New Jersey has done a lot with federal money, the Federal CARES Act money, to address some of the crisis in child care programs, parents, but the staffing issue is still one that needs to be resolved. Okay, let's stay on this. By the way, the, uh, the American Rescue Plan in New Jersey received $700 million for child care. We're going to talk about where that money has gone and where it hasn't gone and what needs to be done. But Winifred, let me follow up with you based on what Seal said. Um, so you, you talked about the closing of the classrooms. You talk, what does that mean, right? What does it mean when you close the classrooms in terms of how many children and families are affected? So... Um the fact that we are competing with Costco and Amazon for staff, right? Um, because they can pay higher wages, they can um, provide better benefits. When we can't open a classroom, you're talking about anywhere from 12 to maybe 20 students who could potentially be affected. Um, and that's 12 to 20 families who can't get service at that location. But this is happening across the state of New Jersey. So it's a big issue. So, so what about if someone says, wait a minute, why don't you just raise tuition? If you raise tuition, you'll have more, Seal's laughing and the assemblywoman's shaking her head. You just raise tuition, you have more revenue, more money to pay staff, keep the classes open, more kids get help. Winifred, you say? Um, so childcare is one of those things that you can only charge what the market can bear. It's not funded as a public good, like we think about our, you know, our K through 12 schools. Um, so we could raise tuition, but that literally a whole sector of families from low to moderate income to the working middle class, they wouldn't be able to afford it. It would literally be just for the wealthy. So let's be clear, though, people of color, people disproportionately who are struggling financially are disproportionately affected by this crisis. While everyone's affected, some are affected more than others. Is that fair? That's fair. And the other thing I would like to point out is the women who generally are working in centers can't even afford to send their children to the centers that they are working in or others without some level of subsidy help. Dr. Lee, let me ask you something. We talked about the long-term implications of a child not having affordable, accessible, quality child care. What does it do, and, our, and we are blessed that all of our children have had that, and I see our daughter Olivia as we're taping this program. It's not about our kids, but just ironically taking her to her first day of middle school as we're doing this and realizing that the, the blessing, the gift that she had to have the experience she had as a two, three, four, five-year-old has a lot to do with her reading now. Not our daughter, anyone's son or daughter. What are the longer-term educational implications of a child not getting this kind of quality childcare at this stage of his or her development? Well, I think we can answer that question by starting to understand kind of what does high quality childcare do for children, both in the present as well as into the future. So when you think about kind of, you know, when there are major disasters and unusual events happen, like the pandemic, like a storm system and so on, one of the things that strong, qualified childcare professionals do is they offer this protective buffer 
which is the relationship that they have with children to help children deal with, articulate and play with the kind of stressors that they have in the here and now, right? So a lot of times we focus so much on the future, we forget like children live each day in the here and now, and that every positive relationship they have with their home families, with their caregivers outside the families become this buffer that helps them to grow strong and positive in the moment. But then in addition to that, within the childcare and preschool setting, um, children learn the kind of very basic but essential skills that allow them to adapt to school, to adult life afterwards from as something as simple as collaborating, listening, sharing, or putting small words to big feelings and to be able to express all those things. All these are the fundamentals, right, of what human beings need in order to cope with the now and in order to prepare for the future. And in addition to that, Steve, it's not just the impact on the child, it's the impact on the family in the here and now, right? For families who are working, for families who are taking care of other children and elders at home, to have a safe place that they know they can entrust their children to, that their children can learn and grow while they attend to other urgent matters of what it means to be a family. All these things, I think, come together um, as the importance of child care to children and to families. Well said. By the way, if you go on, on the website, uh, not only steveautobato.org, but also we'll follow up with the website on Reimagine Child Care, you can see all the previous segments and programs we've done in this series around public awareness as it relates to the child care crisis. Um, Assemblywoman, I want to go to you. You have specific legislation down in the State House that does what? A and B, where is that legislation as it relates to the child care crisis? So I'm, I have through, uh, I'm currently the prime sponsor of two of uh, the bills, which um, thank you to Seal and to Cynthia from ACNJ for helping me navigate through that process. And I am the second prime on um, uh, Assemblywoman Moscata's bill. So I'm going to summarize those bills for you, if you like. Um, Please, as concisely okay. as possible. Yeah, okay, okay. So the first one is attendance versus enrollment, right? And so- Attendance you know, versus, versus enrollment. Attendance, in, right, versus enrollment, right? Having to do with how the funding comes in, correct? Subsidies, I'm speaking about subsidies. Okay, so, you know, the most consequential issue facing the childcare industry is that um, right now with subsidies, we're, the child care centers are being paid based on attendance and not enrollment. Um, and from a policy perspective, you know, public schools are paid on enrollment. And why shouldn't child care centers be paid on enrollment? And, um, and what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to quickly just summarize this for you, because um, we, um, we introduced the bill. It did pass the House. Uh, and it's on the governor's desk now. Right now, there's a bill that has passed both houses. Both houses. The and Senate sitting, and the lower house. Yes, sitting on the governor's desk that would provide, that would change the state subsidy system. And see if I have this wrong, Assemblyman, if I have this wrong, correct mm -hmm. me. That goes from enrollment. From, it's, uh, from attendance to attendance enrollment. to enrollment. For two years. Why is that so critical? It's very critical because... You know, there's so many, so, as, as, a, as a former administrator, I would see our, our, some of the children would not attend school, that we're, we're like operating on thin margins right now too also. So when the children don't attend school, we shouldn't be penalized for that. We should be paid by subsidy with enrollment. So Which is the way the public schools are? Yes, yeah. They're, but child, they're, ch wait a minute, childcare organizations are different? in the way they get state funding? Yeah, subsidies, correct. What, what's the logic behind that? So I think this happened during the Christie administration. I think that um, he, he was, I, I guess, you know, just implying that there was fraudulent activities taking place with the enrollment piece. So he, governor was saying in that administration, right. as I interpret it, that it, you only get paid if the kids are there and there, and there could be fraud going on or whatever. Right, and right. you're trying to change that. By the way, let's deal with that. 
how do we protect against quote unquote fraud or abuse and as opposed to legitimate reasons why kids are not there? So the state needs to put a process in place to evaluate the, the, the attendance of our students, right? And the enrollment of the students. And so this bill that we have right now with Moscata would require that subsidies be paid based on enrollment. You would have kind of a report, a process in place twice a year to um, kind of check in with the child care centers, right? Um, my hope is that if it does get approved, that we find the funding so that this, this enrollment process stays in place long term. Okay, Seal, let me do this, because I know the Assembly has a second piece of legislation. We'll talk about that in the second half of this reimagined child care town meeting. Seal, concisely and clearly, help folks understand, because when we get into the weeds, and that's not a criticism, Assemblywoman, because sometimes the details matter, and that's where the issue is. Concisely and clearly, Seal, in this last minute we have on this segment, why does this matter so much? It matters because this provides stability to the programs that serve our lowest income families who have the least access to childcare. It's not just schools that are funded on the basis of enrollment. If you look at private pay childcare, a parent pays up front, right? A parent pays a month ahead, usually. If something happens, the child is absent, that it's not the, it's not the program that pays. Programs that rely on childcare subsidies because they serve a low income community have no stability. Their payment comes afterwards based on how many children attended. And you know what? The state recognizes this is critical because we use the Federal CARES Act money to start paying on enrollment. It helped childcare survive during the pandemic. And it's what we need now to keep them stable. I wanna, I wanna ask this question. This whole issue of solutions, People say, how do we fix the child care crisis? Um, so my question, Winifred, is this. Do we actually fix it, or do we take a whole series of actions governmentally, from a societal point of view, family point of view, et cetera, et cetera, and make improvements in it? We don't actually fix this crisis, do we, Winifred? No, we need to um, completely reimagine it and and rebuild the infrastructure of it. Um, what does that mean? I'm sorry for interrupting. Re we're using the expression reimagine child care. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. What does that mean to you? Fund early care and education as a public good. The same way we fund K through 12, you should fund zero through five. Well, hold on, you said as a public good. What's the difference between a public good and, and, public, and a public service? So I do believe it's both, right? So uh, uh, child care, allows families to work, right? Um, and without it, families can't work. Like it's real simple, right? If, especially for people who have children zero to five. Um, so that's the, that's the service that we provide. We also make sure that our children are socially, emotionally, cognitively, and um, academically prepared for their next part of their journey. Funding it as a public good means that we would use the money the same way you would use money to fund K through 12 or the firefighters or the police department is the same way you would fund the early care and education sector. By the way, this is Ed, who is a parent from Elizabeth. Um, he asked a very important question regarding single parents. I want to talk about single parents and this child care crisis. And by the way, to all those who sent us video questions and also went on Facebook and Twitter and responded to our social media outreach asking, what one question would you ask about child care? I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all those questions, but this is Ed, a single parent from Elizabeth, New Jersey. How can single parents be expected to afford what a two-income household would afford in terms of quality child care and covering their rent or their mortgage? Cecilia, a single parent versus uh, a so-called intact family or a two-parent family, whatever that means to different people. Talk to Ed, please, and, and, some, and countless others who are in a comparable position. So I think when we talk about reimagining child care, how we assist parents afford child care, I think is critically important. Um, we have a state child subsidy, child care subsidy system, which we've discussed. It doesn't serve, it serves families at very low incomes. That system needs to be strengthened so that families at 
higher incomes are eligible for help. It needs to have a much easier application process. I mean, that's a, a kind of a long-winded way of saying we have to do better by families. To Winifred's point, this is a public good. It keeps families working, it keeps the economy moving, and it provides education for young children at the most critical time. We have to do more to create a system that supports all aspects of it, including parents. I'm curious about something, and I want any one of you to jump in here. Is there actually a child care community, a child care network, if you will, or is it simply a series of child care organizations just all trying to survive, pay their bills, pay their work? You're, you're smiling, Winifred, as I do that. Um, Assemblywoman, is there such a community and a network, or is everyone just fighting for survival? I, I think that on um, post the pandemic, everyone has come together. Um, organizations like ACNJ, the Alliance for the YMCA, we have had dozens and dozens of hearings. Um, um, just last week, um, many advocates um, met with the front office, the governor's front office. The, the governor's office is the front office. Yeah, the front office, yes. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, he was not available because of what happened with the storm. Um, and I have to tell you that- um, By the way, excuse yeah. me, we're taping in, in September. The storm is that storm. We're praying there's not another storm. Mm -hmm. But I just want to put that in context. Pick that, your, your comment up, Sam Elman. Right. So um, we had a number of advocates, probably over 20 advocates on the phone, including ACNJ. Again, just repeating the same. Child care is too expensive. We have a staffing crisis, right? Um, the staff, the, st the child care staff are not paid. Um, they're paid minimum wage. And right. how do you live? How do you live on minimum wage when you're earning twenty five? But it was a community. Of, I'm sorry. If it it's was a community. community. Yes, a community of advocates and parents, and so we are coming together. Finally, this past year, we are fighting hard, fighting hard to ensure that we're, um, you know, subsidies are paid on Rome and are not attendants. That yep. we that the which is in fact your legislation. That as yeah. we speak is sitting on the governor's desk. On the governor's desk, right. correct. And that um, the staff staff are paid more because if you look at the public sector, public schools, they're paid, I don't know, $35,000, $40,000 and above. Well, we're making minimum wage to child care staff, right? Um, well, while we say our children are our most precious resource, those are. who care for them are being paid minimum wage. It's minimum wage. And also, you are not receiving medical benefits. So there's a lot going on right now. And this is why I'm super thrilled that there's a lot of ruckus going on right now, that the advocates are coming together, that we're fighting for our children. And actually, I also understand that about 50% of the uh, women, these are women, they, they can't go to work. They can't go because they can't afford childcare. So 50, about 50% of women in this state cannot go to work because they can't afford childcare. And it's just not fair. Um, but I want to ask Dr. Lee something uh, following up on what the assemblyman is saying, and it's not the first time it's been raised. In your view, Dr. Uh, Lee, how much of the lack of appreciation, lack of, frankly, respect to those who are on the front lines in child care organizations caring for our children, how much do you believe it is a product of the fact that they are disproportionately women? and many of them are women of color. Historically, right, you can imagine kind of any professional field that are primarily staffed by women are shortchanged in wage and recognition and in respect. And I think one of the things that I hope we collectively all understand, right, is that over the last 20 years, there has been bipartisan support for investment in early childhood. But when it comes to childcare, we're still lagging behind. And we have this ongoing challenge on compensation, quality, access, affordability. And in part, I think it's not only just an underappreciation of the people who work in the sector, but also a misunderstanding of how social investments work. We talk so much about kind of how invest early, right? Re economic rewards and other benefits for society as a whole. But anyone who has done any kind of an investment, even just for your retirement portfolio, have to understand 
but you actually have to make the initial investment. <laughs> and that initial investment has to be of a sizable proportion. So all the economic studies that told us about 12 to $16 return for every dollar invested in early childhood, in all of those initial studies, the, the, the staff are well compensated and the services are integrated rather than isolated. The staff are supported with professional development and recognition. And those are efforts that were done in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So the idea that if we want to join together to invest in early childhood, then in addition to look at how great the return is gonna be, we actually have to be faithful to how much it is that we need to invest up front in order to get that kind of return. And that investment starts with investing in the people who are caring for the children. You know, we talk about the state level and the assemblywoman talked about uh, her legislation. And by the way, is there a second piece of legislation, assemblywoman, that is worth uh, acknowledging? I just want to uh, ask yeah, you that. I do. And, you know, uh, so working closely with um, AC&J, thank you, Seal, again. The Associate again. Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Just to clarify that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was a former board member for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, so um, I introduced A5731, providing a gross income tax credit for licensed child care and family um, care centers. Um, this bill is designed to provide tangible incentives for individuals working in child care. And although um, expending state dollars is a worthwhile investment, it is an industry that is crucial to our economy and recovery. You know, so I, you know, I'm very grateful to um, the um, Advocates for Children of New Jersey for walking me through this process, helping me with this. Um, and so we've introduced that as well. It's, um, I don't think it has, um, it has not been posted yet. However, um, I'm hoping not that- Not been posted for a vote. I just want to be clear. When right, for a vote, not correct, posted. yeah. As we speak, it's not posted for a vote. Let me ask you uh, real quick on this, because I know that State Senator Teresa Ruiz, who is uh, a mom of a young child and a whole range of other women who happen to be in the legislature, who happen to be um, moms, have been driving this. Do you sense, and I know this is tricky to ask you this assemblywoman because you have to work with your male colleagues, and I don't want to make this a male versus female thing, but to what degree do you sense that your male colleagues are as committed to this cause as you and some of the other women in the legislature Unanimous. Are. Unanimous. You they're sense it. They're 100%. Is it, bi is it bipartisan? Yes. 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 So, 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 Seal, where's the resistance then? Why is this so hard? If it's unanimous, if it's universal, um, by the way, not universal child care, that's another story. But my question, Seal, is why is it so hard then? Well, I think the, the feedback we've gotten certainly is it's too expensive to implement. But as Assemblywoman Lopez points out, this has a safeguard in it. It allows the state to assess in two years what's the financial impact. And uh, you know, back to something you said early on, Steve, let's not forget that New Jersey is getting $700 million of federal money specifically for child care, in addition to money that's going out to local communities, to the school districts that could be used for child care. We're still waiting for our state to put out what its plan is for that money. Talk about reimagining child care and uh, Dr. Lee's point about you have to make the investment up front. We have the money to make that investment. How are we going to use it most effectively? If that were to happen, Winifred, and by the way, Winifred Smith-Jenkins, Senior Director of Zadies, uh, nurturing Den. It, check out our, our first part of this town hall if you missed it. She talked a lot about her organization. If that were to happen, Winifred, what Cecilia just described and the assemblywoman described, what would it mean for you and your colleagues at Zadie's Nurturing Den in terms of what you could provide those children and their families? So I think if we could take a step back, what could we bring to the table for the for the staff, right? Um, you could professionalize the benefits that the staff are receiving. You're talking about medical, you're talking about dental, life vision, um, retirement benefits, because science essentially tells us that the key to quality is the is the workforce. Is the are the they don't have it? I'm sorry to go, they don't have it now. No, so not necessarily. It's too it just, expensive. I want everyone to think about what's being said. And again, my job is not to advocate or be on a soapbox. Everyone at the Caucus Educational Corporation, our full-time staff, 
their health benefits, there's a pension contribution they make and we make. And it's not us, just think of most organizations. That is the norm. What's being said is it's not the norm in the childcare industry. And I'm just trying to understand why that is the case other than Winifred precedent. So you have to remember that we truly are small businesses, right? Like there's, there's no, so you either get funding from the subsidy program or, you know, we could call it state tuition, right? Or you get funding, you get paid through parent tuition, but that's it. Like that's the, you know, that's the only so way you get no paid. There are no other sources. No. So that's the problem. And, and, and you can charge an exorbitant amount, but who can afford it if you do that? It's just a catch 22. It is. Um, and by the way, the question, we, we're a lot of social media questions. And again, we'll put up our, our Facebook uh, page and our, our Twitter handle as well if people want to continue asking questions and we'll, we'll continue this conversation offline. Many people asked um, when we put out the social media question is what, what is the number one child care question you would want to ask this distinguished panel as part of this reimagined child care town hall? Here it is. How exactly can we establish free universal child care, not just in New Jersey, but in the United States of America? What needs to be done to make that happen? Seal, take it on. So we have an opportunity. Again, we have the federal money that can help seed that kind of idea. It's going to require a future state investment for sure, but we have that money. And you know, New Jersey, I think more than any other state in the country, is well placed to do this because we are ahead of the rest of the country in our high quality universal preschool program. Where's, where's the Biden administration on this? I think they're very supportive. Um, I think the, the federal ARC funds, the American Rescue Plan, uh, takes the first step toward this. There's more uh, federal funding being debated. Uh, I think, again, it's how do we use it most effectively? Actually, we know what to do. We have some great models here in New Jersey. Again, preschool, um, our preschool program is I think the best in the country. We can look at the lessons learned from that to Winifred and the Assemblywoman's point to create a true birth to five system of early education for young children in our state. Assemblywoman, jump on this. You said there's universal across the board bipartisan support in the state of New Jersey and the state legislature for the kinds of things we're talking about. What is your sense? You're not in the United States Congress, but you have a sense of things nationally. <gasps> With so many things being politicized in so many different parts of our country, geographically seeming to believe different things for different reasons, to what degree do you believe that there's universal across the board support, bipartisan support in the United States Congress for the kind of reimagining of childcare that we're talking about, Assemblywoman? I, you know, I could speak for the legislature, okay? Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the legislature. Go ahead. So, okay. So obviously we have 120 members, right? And I would tell you that any 40 time, senators, 80 se members of the it, state assembly. Per correct. And any time there's a bill that is introduced, whether it's in the Senate or in the assembly, whether it's on the R side or the D side, there is 100% support for those bills. Why? Because so many of our members either have children or, are, or have grandbabies, yeah, and they understand. They understand the struggles that parents go through with tuition. Um, again, childcare being too expensive. They understand um, how they have to make a, diff a, a choice. Do I go back to work and have to pay this enormous rate for childcare or do I stay home? And so understand that in the legislature, we have 100% bipartisan support for all these child care bills and um, pieces of legislation. But that's in the state legislature. I, and I want to go to Jackie uh, from Scotch Plains, who has a video question. But, but Dr. Lee, I need to ask you, what is your sense from a national perspective? It's one thing to say that the Biden administration is supportive. And we're not a show about politics. We're a show about policy. And so my question is, from your vantage point, what do you see nationally? And you do look at this nationally, doctor. To what degree, while the assemblyman's talking about this universal support in the state legislature, both parties geographically across the board, men, women, doesn't matter, all in. Do you see something comparable to that in the United States Congress as it relates to child care? What I see, uh, Steve, I think across the country, across both blue and red states and anything in between, 
is that there's a growing consensus, I think, on two things, whether you base it on science or just based on common sense. One is this idea that you can't make a lasting positive impact on children by skipping over the adults that are in the middle. And these adults are the educators, caregivers, and the families. Right, That is as much common sense as, as it is science. And then based on that principle, we can think about how do we legislate, how do we fund, and how do we prioritize. And the second part, and, and the pandemic particularly reminded all of us that, which is that all of us value families, no matter what state we live in. And then if we value families, we have to recognize that families don't just thrive on its own as a little bubble. When things happen around the world, families need support. So that infrastructure of support around the families, supporting that is the same as valuing families. And in that context, for families with young children, the childcare infrastructure is absolutely integral part of, of the support that families need. And these two fundamental principles ought to be the kind of things that can bring us together and figure out the financial and policy solutions that can get this done. I want to, as I said, we had so many video questions that, that came in. This is uh, Jackie from Scotch Plains, correct? Jackie talks about, um, well, let Jackie speak for Jackie. Let's go to the clip. When the pandemic started, I was forced to stay home. How can New Jersey support working parents? Yeah. Seal? Do you hear that? So I think we've talked a lot about ways to reimagine childcare supporting staff. But one, one thing that I think about in her question and, and the gentleman, the single parent, is we have a sector of our childcare system that we have uh, not paid enough attention to, and that's home based or family childcare. Um, there is a network of family child care providers who provide care for children in their own home. It's a smaller setting, it's five or fewer children. Many parents who are looking for that small setting have unusual work hours, not nine to six, uh, have very young children that they'd like to see in a one-on-one -on -one relationship could benefit from home-based care. Um, we have not developed that enough in New Jersey. We treat it a little differently than we do family child care. And I think this is a time to create incentives for more people to be willing to register as family child care providers um, and provide care, especially to children who are using child care subsidies. Yeah, if we get a couple of minutes left, let me ask you this, and 30 seconds or less. Why should anyone watching this program, children or not, grandchildren or not, help them understand, Winifred, why this matters to them directly and personally, and for us as a society who says we care deeply about our children? Winifred. Because how we hold the people who are holding our children will determine how these little people we're holding will grow up into society. Um, and so that's the reason why I feel like this should be just a universal issue that we all care about. So if someone says, that's not my kid, you say? That's I say, not my kid you're holding. That's not my grandchild you're holding, you say? But that kid that I'm holding may end up impacting you later on. They may be holding you. Well said. Assembly, I'm going to take a shot at this. Why should well, people care? People should care again. Um, child care again, like I mentioned earlier, is too expensive, right? Teachers are not paid at the same parity like public schools are. They are not receiving uh, medical benefits. Um, they're, the child care centers are operating in very thin margins. So again, we go back to the attendance versus enrollment. So. I will tell, share with you, and I'll leave with this message, is that, you know, we should, yeah, ch child, care, child care centers are, um, they're not the public good that they should be, and they should be treated as the public good. And, you know, again, public schools are paid on enrollment, not attendance, and the same should apply to child care centers. Dr. Lee, tell folks why they should care. I think we value families, and by that we need to value the system of support that families need, and child care is an essential part of that system of support. And finally, Seal, someone says, this isn't, doesn't affect me. 
It's, it's just it's not possible. It's only being more basic. How do you more basic than this? We're all connected, right? Our state needs residents who are working, who are self-sufficient, and can pay taxes that support the rest of us, all of us in New Jersey. And to do that, businesses, employers need staff. They need workers who can come to work, be focused on work, um, not absent. Um, and child care is essential to creating that workforce. I feel strongly, I agree completely that child care is the educational system for our youngest children. But from a practical reality, it's a financial engine for our state as well. I cannot thank this very distinguished, our very distinguished panel of experts on this reimagined child care town hall about this crisis. And people use the word crisis to over dramatize certain situations. That's not the case here. A genuine, real, substantive, longstanding crisis that uh, um, affects all of us. So I cannot thank you enough. I want to thank all of you for watching and uh, engaging in this important town hall meeting around this child care crisis. I'm Steve Adubato. We hope to see you next time.